April 24th, 1985. In Nova Scotia, Halifax Harbor is home to the province's two major cities, its capital, Halifax, and Dartmouth on the eastern side of the bay. On this particular Tuesday afternoon, 17-year-old Gail Tucker is getting ready to move out of her mother's Dartmouth apartment. She is excited about the prospects of landing a job at a fish processing plant on the province's west coast. Gail has sent her luggage ahead with a friend, and all she has are the clothes on her back. Her mother, Mary Lake, offers her money for the bus, but can't get it until the banks open the next day. Gail decides not to wait for the money, but to hitchhike instead. At 5 p.m. that afternoon, Gail gets into an old model car that leaves Dartmouth and her old life behind. Several days later, Mary Lake has not heard from her daughter. She notifies police who begin to trace Gail's movements across the province. Over the next few months, police identify the older model car, but it offers them no new leads. It's just one of several vehicles that stop to pick up the hitchhiking teenager. Police track Gail to the village of Weymouth, Nova Scotia, but here, the trail ends. October 1985, six months after Gail Tucker's disappearance, a man walking his dog in a wooded area south of Weymouth makes a gruesome discovery, the skeletal remains of a human body. Police called to the scene also find a pile of clothes nearby. No attempt has been made to bury the corpse and decomposition as such that shovels have to be used to remove the remains. Two days later, the body is identified through dental records and jewelry found at the scene. It is 17-year-old Gail Tucker. Forensics determines that the girl was stabbed repeatedly in the side with a single-edged blade. The police are unable to link the crime to any suspects. For Gail's family and the police, it is a dead end. But in reality, it is just the beginning. As the years pass, the murder of Gail Tucker becomes another statistic, one of hundreds of unsolved homicides across Canada. By 1998, police and Dartmouth have all but closed the file. They keep it open only at the insistence of the victim's mother, Mary Lake, who still believes that one day they will link a name and a face to this terrible crime. February 1998. In the city of Moncton, it's another humid weekend, typical New Brunswick weather for this time of year. With a population of just over 100,000, Moncton is a city where most people feel safe and secure. Moncton's basically a, a peace-loving sort of a city and, uh, and a very vibrant city. Growing and uh, the people are industrious and, and uh, hardworking. It's a small city, it has a small city mentality. Not small town, not big city. In an apartment building in one quiet Moncton neighborhood, 48-year-old Joan Hicks gets her 11-year-old daughter, Nina, ready for bed. They have only been in Moncton for about six months. They have come from Musgrave Harbor, Newfoundland, the island province, where both have spent their entire lives. But extraordinary circumstances have given Joan the chance to leave her hometown and start a new life in Moncton. She had been helping people who were in trouble with the law in Newfoundland. Uh, one of those people uh, was later convicted for sexual assault and sent to Dorchester Penitentiary. So she was writing letters to her friend. This friend was asking her, there are other people here who would like to get letters. And this is where Aubrey Sparks comes in. Here is a man who was in prison for murdering his wife. She started writing to him. Those letters apparently became love letters. And she decided that she wanted to move to Moncton to be closer to him to see if this relationship would work. Joan's family is concerned that she has never actually met Aubrey Sparks, 
Joan and Aubrey's only communication has been telephone calls and the exchange of letters and photographs. All of her family and friends in Musgrave Harbor tried to talk her out of it. They even asked the RCMP to try to dissuade her from coming to Moncton. Joan's adult daughter, Judy, is one of the concerned family members. I didn't want her to go, but it was her decision to go to Moncton. That's all we could do. Nina is nervous about moving to a strange new city. Before she leaves, Nina gives her aunt a photograph of herself, dressed in her Sunday best. If anything happens to me, she says, post this picture so people will be able to find me and bring me home. Nina was 11, and she uh, loved going to brownies, to church, Sunday school, playing with her friends. There was no good boy. When they got there, they, they called, and that was it. For a short time, Joan and Nina live at a shelter in Moncton. During their stay, Joan befriends a young woman, 22-year-old Tammy McLean. Tammy has been having problems with her boyfriend, and she finds in Joan a compassionate heart and a willingness to listen. The shelter helps Joan and Nina find a basement apartment. Residents can't help but like their new neighbors, who they describe as friendly, polite, and shy. Nina attends a nearby school and seems to fit right in. Nina called and uh, I asked her about school and she, she liked going to school and they were into their apartment and she seemed to be quite content. Tammy McLean and her boyfriend are often guests at the apartment, stopping by for coffee or a game of cards. But on the night of February 28, 1998, Tammy McLean comes alone. What we do know is that on that day, Joan Hicks got a call from her friend, Tammy McLean. Tammy was having problems with her boyfriend. She said, she needed to get away. So Joan invited her to her apartment. Tammy was obviously distraught. They spent a lot of time talking. Uh, Joan wanted to make sure that she had a place to go, that she wasn't going to be uh, victimized or caught in a situation. At 5 a.m., a taxi cab pulls up in front of the apartment building. As Tammy leaves the building and approaches the cab, the driver notices another woman with a man at the entranceway. As she pulls away, the driver sees them go back inside the building. If the woman in the entranceway is Joan Hicks, it is the last time anyone sees her alive. March 1st, 1998. The city of Moncton awakens to another gloomy Sunday. But on this particular morning, the New Brunswick community's small town sensibility is about to be severely shaken. In the early morning hours, a man named Glenn Bennett enters a Moncton police station, agitated and very frightened. He tells officers that he has just witnessed a brutal murder and could do nothing to stop it. His first events was he was a terrified spectator at the incident and then he didn't know what to do. But as soon as he got separate, he went to the police and reported it. And the police then go around, find the bodies, and matters proceed after that. Just before 8 that morning, residents in one Moncton neighborhood are surprised to see police cars pull up outside an apartment building. Officers ask the building's superintendent to unlock the door to a basement apartment he knows belongs to a new tenant. The police find 48-year-old Joan Hicks lying on the floor near the bathroom in a pool of her own blood. They immediately cordon off the stairs leading to the basement and begin scouring the area for evidence. It was a part of town that, that is just on the border of where it starts to go a little bit downhill. 
was number three, basement, uh, uh, where just the windows would have looked out onto the street. Uh, police tape everywhere. Investigators discover that Joan has been beaten and strangled, and her throat has been cut with a serrated edge knife. Her 11-year-old daughter, Nina, is missing. The bed in the bedroom has been slept in, but detectives find it empty. The bedroom closet, however, is not. The little girl that was hanging in a closet when she was found, uh, Ella probably was smothered to death prior to that and then just hung in the closet. It was not a pretty scene. The scene was apparently so gruesome that there was a special psychiatric team that was brought in. Uh, they were very upset. A lot of them had said that they had never seen anything like it. In some crime scenes I'll never forget. You have to build up a certain amount of immunity, otherwise you can't function. And it sounds cold, but that's the reality. You have to. Police talk to Joan's neighbors. One of them recalls hearing loud voices coming from an apartment, but isn't sure which one. As word gets around, residents of the quiet neighborhood are numb. Moncton is one of those towns where people really do know each other. This is a place where people still don't lock their doors to this day. So to have something like that happen in that community, it did affect everybody. It's all everybody was talking about. Joan and Nina Hicks have only been in Moncton a short time. Back in their hometown of Musgrave Harbor, Newfoundland, police arrive at the home of Joan's daughter, Judy, and her two sons. My grandmother was with me. And uh, Tyler and Dylan went to the door. And they came and they said, Mom, the caps is in the driveway. It's OK. They're probably just turning around. Then the knock came to the door. And uh, it was a star CMP officer. And there was Salvation Army officer and his wife. They come in and they wanted me to sit. At first, you think of an accident. You know, maybe they were in a car accident or something like that. But when I got the news, when I had realized how they died, I phoned Moncton. They had uh, told me there was an eyewitness. The police tell Judy that a man named Glenn Bennett was a horrified spectator at her mother's home the night of the murders. I couldn't believe that somebody had watched, been there and watched. But I learned that he was the one that reported it to the police. And that's how they know who killed Mom and Nina. Acting on another tip from eyewitness Glenn Bennett, police converge on a two-story apartment in another part of Moncton, not long after discovering the bodies. It is the residence of 22-year-old Tammy McLean. But at the moment, Police are more interested in her boyfriend. I learned that he was a friend of mom's, that he would uh, go there, he and his girlfriend, and uh, they were very close with mom, and they uh, would play cards or have coffee, I guess. According to Glenn Bennett, the man responsible for the murders is 34-year-old Michael McGray. If there wasn't an eyewitness, he might have, Michael McGray might have walked away. Police arrest McGray in front of his girlfriend's apartment building. He is then held custody and brought to Moncton's provincial courthouse for arraignment. The first time 
I heard the name Michael Wayne McGray was when I had called the RCMP communications person as we were calling every half hour and he said we have a suspect. You get a sense from uh, the bailiffs who are transporting them back and forth how they feel about the person and their level of guilt by how far they park away from the door because the media is waiting with their cameras to get a picture. When they showed up with Michael Wayne McGray they parked a long ways away from the door. So we did get shots of him handcuffed, being let in up the stairs. Average looking guy, head somewhat down, but he wasn't trying to hide. He knew that he was gonna do the walk and he did the walk. They were pretty sure that this was Dermaine and uh, I didn't want any other family to go through. With the suspect in custody, the courts must now find out why these terrible murders happened in the first place. They look for answers in the mind of 34-year-old Michael Wayne McGray. But no one is prepared for what they are about to learn. March 1998. The city of Moncton, New Brunswick, has been rocked by a terrible double homicide. The victims, Joan Hicks and her daughter Nina, are laid to rest in their hometown of Musgrave Harbor, Newfoundland. Nina's friends place a white ribbon on her casket, and her classmates hold a special tribute to say goodbye. Musgrave Harbor is a very small place and everybody knows everybody. And they were obviously very traumatized by this whole thing. What kind of a human would do this to Mama Nina? How could a man kill a child and mom? He was a drifter and I think Normally, from what I read, a psychopath develop these tendencies when they're young. Michael Wayne McGray's criminal record comes under scrutiny as Moncton detectives investigate his previous convictions. Michael Wayne McGray spends much of his childhood in group homes and reform school. In his early teens, he is kicked out of his father's home and begins drifting from one city to the next. As an adult, he is in and out of jail, mostly for robbery and other property offenses. Early in his career, he commits one of those crimes 140 kilometers from Moncton in the city of St. John, New Brunswick. November, 1987. In St. John, a taxi driver working the night shift stops to pick up three men. In the late 80s, uh, St. John was uh, a very uh, much an industrial city and our investigators uh, certainly investigated a lot more crime with respect to violence than they would be uh, doing today. Essentially what happened, um, three people uh, got together and conjured up a plan to rob a taxi driver. One of the men, Mark Daniel Gibbons, sits in the front seat beside the taxi driver while his two accomplices, Norman Warren and Michael Wayne McGray, get in the back. When they got to the location, they informed the taxi driver that it wasn't uh, their, his normal drive today. He was being robbed. He made a motion to go into his pocket, but Mark Gibbon uh, had a knife and was able to stab the cab driver in the hand with the knife. They left the scene and they ran away. Police arrive at the scene and begin searching for the three suspects. The first one they find is Mark Gibbons, but it is too late for an arrest. He made his way down to uh, Market Square, which is a mall in, in St. John, and he was found actually by a janitor who summons mall security, who in fact summons us, and he had expired. Investigators quickly established the cause of death, a single stab wound just below the heart. 
the, the wound actually was just below, uh, just at the very tip of the heart, and uh, he bled out essentially what happened. But he was obviously going for help. In a matter of minutes, a botched robbery has become a bizarre murder with no clear motive. The next day, it turns even more unusual when the murdered man's accomplices call the police themselves. They make a phone call to the police station wanting to know if we knew the whereabouts or if we heard from Mark Gibbon. Well, at that time, we have a murder scene, and uh, we're very intrigued by the phone call. We traced the phone call back to this Jermaine Street apartment. Our officers arrived there, and some people uh, leave the back door running. Police arrest Mark Gibbons' accomplices in the taxi cab robbery, who are now also murder suspects. At this point, McGray has had a few run-ins with the law, mainly for breaking and entering. Norman Warren has a long record of violent crime, including the murder of a cab driver for which he served 17 years in prison. McGray tells them that Warren stabbed Mark Gibbons for botching the robbery. Combined with statements made by the girlfriends of the three men, police are confident that they have their man. The investigators of the day talked to all the potential witnesses basically females that were in the apartment, and um, they sort of sided with the position that Warren, in fact, was probably the one that uh, committed the murder. Norman Warren was then charged with the homicide of Mark Gibbon, went through trial, and uh, he was found not guilty. Detectives on the case are shocked by the decision and must be satisfied with the fact that Norman Warren is behind bars for attempted robbery. McGray also receives a five-year sentence for his role in the robbery. 1998, lawyer Wendell Maxwell must now defend Michael McGray for the murder of Joan and Nina Hicks. But as the trial date approaches, word circulates that Joan and Nina may not have been Michael McGray's first victims. The source is McGray himself. At some point in prison, as Michael Wayne McGray was being interviewed, he made a plea bargain with the police officers. We found out that he had confessed to killing two gay men in Montreal in the early 90s. <laughs> During the time in question, Montreal police are baffled by a string of violent stabbing deaths in the homosexual community. Over a 12-month period, six men had been murdered. In Montreal's gay village, there is growing concern. In May 1991, local gay activists hold a meeting demanding that police review the details about what they fear is a serial killer stalking homosexuals in Montreal. That fear is compounded by the unsolved murders of two more gay men that fall, both stabbed to death while taking late night bike rides in city parks. Pierre Sangalo, director of the major crime section of the Montreal Urban Community of Police, orders the files to be pulled for the first six killings. By the end of 1993, Intensive police investigations conclude that while there are different links between some of the killings, they are not the work of just one person. We could be talking about two serial killers or we could be talking about one group of serial killers. The investigation does little to allay the fears of the city's gay community. Between 1989 to 1996, a total of 21 gay men are murdered in Montreal. By the fall of 1997, six of those murders are still unsolved. At the time of his confession in 1999, there is no evidence to suggest that McGray had any role in the killings. In fact, he had been eliminated as a suspect since he had been incarcerated at Quebec's Lama Casa prison at the time. But then, McGray reveals how released on a three-day pass on Good Friday, March 29, 1991, he travels to Montreal and makes a required visit to a halfway house in the city's north end. 
The next day, March 30th, McGray goes to Montreal's Gay Village and meets recently retired high school teacher Robert Asselet in a bar. They enjoy a few drinks and talk hockey until Robert invites McGray back to his apartment. At Robert's apartment, the two men have a few more drinks and watch television until McGray falls asleep on Robert's couch. When McGray awakens at six on Easter Sunday, he hears Robert getting dressed in his bedroom and grabs a knife from the kitchen. He orders the retired school teacher to lie down on the floor, but Robert just laughs at him. McGray strikes him on the head with a lamp, then stabs him repeatedly in the chest and the throat. He leaves the apartment with a bottle of liquor, but leaves the victim's wallet and credit cards behind. It will be a week before Robert Asselet's body is found, but the story doesn't end there. Within 24 hours of killing Robert Asselet, Michael McGray is already stalking his next victim. He returns to the gay village and meets unemployed salesman Gaetan Etier. Gaetan invites McGray back to his small bachelor apartment to share a bottle of wine and watch a hockey game. McGray tells police that after turning down an advance from Gaetan, he watches him pass out on a fold-out bed and continues to watch him for the rest of the night. The next morning, McGray walks over to the bed and smashes a beer bottle against Gaetan Etier's head, then attacks him with a knife. Gaetan fights back, trying to get to the phone, but McGray cuts the line. When Gaetan is dead, McGray leaves the apartment with the bottle of wine that the two men were supposed to share the night before. He then leaves Montreal, breaking the conditions of his three-day pass. McGray gets arrested later that month and is returned back to jail. In his confession, McGray reveals details that only the killer could know, such as the beer bottle and the cut phone line hold back evidence that the police never released to the public. It is a startling confession. However, it will not be the last. March 1999, Renous Prison, New Brunswick. Murder suspect Michael McGray is in custody for the deaths of Joan and Nina Hicks. While awaiting trial, McGray astounds investigators by confessing to two unrelated murders, those of Robert Asselet and Gaetan Etier, both brutally slain eight years earlier in Montreal. But Michael McGray doesn't stop there. He tells police officers that he is also responsible for a murder in New Brunswick. In 1999, I received a telephone call from an investigator here in Moncton uh, inquiring um, had we uh, had a homicide uh, with respect to a, a chap by the name of Mark Gibbon. And sure enough, there was an unsolved homicide. Uh, we did charge somebody that did go through the court system and the person was found not guilty. And we went to Renews Prison, which is uh, here in, in the province of New Brunswick, uh, maximum security prison, and I had a meeting with uh, Mr. McGray. And he said, I want you to know something right now. And this is before this, the, the, the actual confession unfolded. He said, I am not doing this because I had emotions or I feel bad for anybody. As a result of the, uh, the conversation with uh, Michael, uh, we obtained a very detailed uh, confession uh, where he, in fact, was the person that stabbed Mark Gibbon and uh, caused his death. St. John, New Brunswick. As McGray tells it, on the night of November 14th, 1987, he joins Mark Gibbons and Norman Warren in a plan to rob a taxi. When the plan goes bad, the three men take off on foot. Warren is the slowest, and McGray and Gibbons soon leave him behind. They stop to catch their breath near the city's YMCA. At that point, McGray took this homemade fashion knife and stabbed uh, Gibbon in the chest, just below the heart, once. Uh, put him to his knees. Uh, McGray was upset that the robbery was a botch robbery. But he also talks about the fact that when he met Gibbons, he didn't like him. 
and he knew he was going to do something to him, but he didn't know he was going to kill him. McGray leaves Gibbons to die and meets up with Norman Warren. They make their way back to the house, and um, all three of them had quasi-girlfriends, and the girls were starting to ask, where, where did Mark go? But at some point, um, McGray shows the girls a knife, this old knife with blood on it, and passed it to the girls and told the girls to clean it up. After their arrest, McGray uses Norman Warren's violent past to pin the murder on him, with the help of witnesses. He had told the girls that he, he was the one that killed uh, Gibbon, but that it was important that they stick by him and uh, not tell. And they told as much as they could possibly tell without implicating McGray. Unfortunately, these women are women that have um, abused alcohol and drugs. These women suffered a lot of violence over their lives. Um, they were very afraid of McGray if he's killed, and they were sure that he'd, he'd killed somebody. Um, that he would actually do that to them. Michael McGray's confession is astounding, but Reed and his partner must corroborate everything the suspect has told them. And uh, two of the witnesses, uh, certainly uh, when we went back and, and spoke to them afterwards, told us everything he did and said. Uh, it was very easy to, to lay the murder charge. By the time the trial for the murders of Joan and Nina Hicks is set to begin, Michael McGray has also been charged with the deaths of Mark Gibbons and the two men in Montreal. The media starts to use the phrase serial killer when it talks about Michael Wayne McGray. You, you don't hear that too often in Canada. It, it certainly was uh, snowballing because uh, McGray was, uh, he was sort of uh, cooperating with the media at certain points in, in, in releasing information. Uh, on homicides. What isn't clear is the tie that binds the McGray murders together. Serial killers usually choose victims of a similar type, yet there is no apparent link between the murders in Moncton and those in St. John in Montreal. Monday, March 20th, 2000. Two years after the brutal slaying of Joan Hicks and her daughter Nina, 35-year-old Michael McGray surprises a Moncton courtroom by pleading guilty to the murder of Joan Hicks. He didn't want to go to trial. He wanted to plead guilty to the murder of the mother, and so consequently I made motions before the court and he pled guilty to that uh, particular charge. But there was no emotion in the plea. He had some emotion about going to trial, but not about her per se. In his statement, McGray describes how he spent the day mainlining cocaine with acquaintance Glenn Bennett. He tells of becoming overwhelmed with an urge to kill somebody, anybody. McGray and Bennett go to the home of Joan Hicks. His girlfriend was at mom's that night, and uh, he came, asked his girlfriend to, well, go home, I guess, and she did, and, uh, he went to the washroom and uh, sang out to mom. He wanted toilet paper. So mom went to the closet to get him the, the toilet paper. And this is when he killed mom. I learned that he strangled her and that cut her throat to do the job. McGray refuses, however, to admit to the murder of Nina Hicks. He was adamant about not pleading guilty with respect to the 11-year-old child, Nina. My guess uh, is that child murderers in the penitentiary have a very difficult time. They're less than a human being in the sight of other inmates. The first-degree murder charge for the killing of Joan Hicks carries a life sentence with little chance for parole. The prosecution decides to suspend proceedings in the second murder, pending further investigation. It was hard, very hard when we got the news. I was very proud in one way, you know, 
he's going to jail for first degree murder for mom. But Nina was like nobody. Michael McGray has been implicated in five different murders. But even more shocking, police learn there might be more. March 20th, 2000. Michael Wayne McGray pleads guilty to the murder of Joan Hicks. What is even more surprising is his willingness to confess to three additional stabbing deaths, one of which goes back more than a decade. While being transported to the federal penitentiary in Renus, New Brunswick, McGray tells a police officer that he is willing to confess to 11 other killings in cities across Canada and in Seattle, Washington. In exchange, he wants immunity from prosecution and medical help to control an overwhelming need to kill. When police refuse to meet his terms, McGray goes to the media, including the National Wire Service, Canadian Press. And what amounted to about uh, a 15 minute uh, interview with him and it blew me away. I can remember listening to his answers, listening to how detached he was. There was uh, no ranting, there was no raving, it was, it absolutely blew me away as to how detached and unemotional he was. As though he was just talking about going to the grocery store and what he had picked up. It's just something that I really enjoyed doing. And I mean, when it comes out, I mean, some of these murders were just horrendous, right? Everybody asks me, you know, I have any remorse for the victims, and you know, I'm not going to bore you. I don't. I don't regret it, and I don't have any remorse. The only thing I regret, really, is that it ended. Several times during the interview, McGray talks about an irresistible craving to kill and his need to hurt people to satisfy this hunger deep inside. McGray describes drifting from Vancouver to Halifax, stalking the strips where junkies and prostitutes hang out, and gay districts where strangers are easy targets. What we know of serial killers is that there's usually some kind of a pattern. There's a certain type of person they murder. In Michael Wayne McGray's case, his motivation was a need to kill. Who he killed doesn't really seem to matter. You know, I asked him, I said, what you know, people want to really know is like, do you have conscience? And you know, he said that you know he was grappling with uh, the whole idea of conscience. It bothered him that you know it didn't bother him, which most normal people would say. What? It was just, it, 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 it was, again, it was so surreal. As surreal as it seems, McGray's next admission is a bombshell. I asked him, you know, what was your first murder? And he said it was Gail Tucker in Nova Scotia. Gail Tucker was a 17-year-old uh, girl who just happened to be hitchhiking and had the unfortunate luck of running across Michael McGray and a companion in a truck. And you know, he just gave a very brief, very um, dispassionate description of, of what happened. Me and another guy were driving, we just picked her up, she was hitchhiking, and uh, we stopped, I pulled her out of the truck, stabbed her, and left her. Wasn't lost to remember. It took my breath away. But it took my breath away because of just how absolutely devoid of emotion it was. Over the next two months, McGray pleads guilty to the first-degree murders of Robert Asselet and Gaeta Etier in Montreal, and the second-degree murder of robbery accomplice Mark Gibbons in St. John. A year later, in May 2001, 
McGray finally faces the charge of first-degree murder in the death of Nina Hicks after her family requests that the stay be lifted by the prosecution. I uh, wrote a letter to the Attorney General. So they called us back and they were going to take him to trial for Nina. But he appeared and there was no trial. He just uh, went to a court hearing and uh, pleaded guilty. A few days later in a Halifax courtroom, McGray pleads guilty to the 1985 murder of hitchhiker Gail Tucker, based on his own confession and corroborating evidence. They questioned him with respect to what he knew, whether it would match the physical evidence they had, because the police had a lot of information that was never released. Based on this information, they proceeded and laid the first degree murder charge against Michael McRae. In court, Gail Tucker's family hears details of the teenager's final moments. How, after she refuses to provide oral sex, McGray drags her from the truck, rips off her clothes, then stabs her repeatedly when her struggling infuriates him. And how he and a mystery accomplice drag her body into the woods. Don't have enough evidence to establish who was with him. From what I've read and from my personal uh, belief, I don't think anyone had anything else to do with it other than him. McGray is again sentenced to life in prison to run concurrently with his five other sentences. For Gail's mother, Mary Lake, it has been a long, painful road. Her mother spent from 1985 to 2001 trying to find who murdered her daughter. I think they were at a dead end for a great deal of the time. But they, the file was put together with respect to the physical evidence and everything, and it was, it was kept alive, in other words. It was always active because of her persistence. Michael Wayne McGray is currently serving his time at the Atlantic Maximum Security Facility in Renews, New Brunswick. He has stated that, if given the chance, he would murder a guard, another prisoner, anyone who could satisfy his uncontrollable craving to kill. From his own experience, McGray's defense lawyer, Wendell Maxwell, knows this is no idle threat. I went to see him just to go over what was going to happen in Halifax and what to put in the interview room. I was there probably half an hour, 45 minutes, talked to him. Then I left. When they searched him, they found a homemade shiv. Knife. Guy said, Michael, what was this for? And he said, oh, I was, I was going to do Wendell. If I'd have been alone with him, I probably would not be doing this interview with you today. That's why I really believe that Michael's a psychopath. He has no conscience. He acts on impulse. He doesn't sit and weigh whether it's right or wrong. It's just the impulse, and when it's done, it's done. There's no conscience. There's nothing after that. That's the way Michael was with these murders. I don't think they've necessarily accurately established whether or not he actually did all of the 16 murders that he claimed. My opinion is it doesn't really matter. Numbers don't matter. Numbers don't matter to Gail Tucker's family. Numbers don't matter to the Hicks family who lost, you know, their daughter and their granddaughter. You know, I just, to me, the numbers are irrelevant. He took everything away from me. All the family I had was Mom and Nina. It changed my family. It changed everything. You live day by day, and they're always in your mind. Always. <laughs>